Welcome everyone. My name is Diego and I work for the Historic Districts Council. Thank you so much for joining us to this uh, preservation school uh, event where we're gonna have Matt Lamp, who is a location manager, and Lorna Nove, who is uh, an advisor for HDC. They are gonna be talking about the process of location management. And Matt is gonna be talking about his experience working with the community and his process of finding different locations that represent specific um, neighborhoods and cultures across New York City. Um, Lorna is gonna be moderating and coordinating this conversation. So welcome Lorna and thank you so much. Thank you and welcome everybody. Matt and I are gonna talk for about 45 minutes or so and then we're gonna open up the event to questions that you might have. So Matt, first of all, Diego, thank you for arranging this. And Matt, it's great to see you again. We have a long, wonderful history of working together. And everybody, you're talking to one of the best location managers, most experienced location managers in New York City. So really, it's an honor, Matt. So I thought we would kick the evening off by having you tell us a little bit about just what the role of the locations department and a locations manager is both on film and TV. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm Matt, Matt Lamb. Um, thank you, Lorna. That was uh, too kind. Um, to, to be clear, Lorna was, uh, she, she was there the very first day I was an intern uh, a very long time ago. Um, so I'm, we've known each other for quite a while, but um, uh, I, so as, as everybody was saying, I'm a location manager for film and TV. Primarily in my case, it's television. Um, that's been my bread and butter. Um, and uh, what, what is a location manager? So um, when you make a television show, uh, most television shows that are, um, especially nowadays, are, are shot, you know, par at least partially on location and uh, partially in the studio. And um, we are, as location managers, we're members of the Directors Guild of America. And um, we work directly with, um, we work directly with, uh, you know, the producer and the director and the production designer um, to kind of articulate the vision of whatever uh, project we're working on. So let me, let me explain that. I'll go back a little bit again, location manager. So, you know, I'll break it down for you. I get a script uh, or I should say this, I get a call. I get a call from a producer saying, Hey, Matt, I've got this project. Um, it's, you know, uh, something that we're going to probably shoot in the next, uh, you know, we probably would get it up and running in about three months and we need to start scouting for it. It's, um, you know, I'll give you the example of the show that I worked on last winter. Um, it was the show that um, took place in Detroit and we had to find Detroit in and around um, the metro area. Now that show was was actually um, shot in New Jersey, but I can give you the, you know, so so the process, how it started, it really kind of starts that way. I get a call from a producer and I'm like one of the first people they call because, you know, they, they want to get a jump on the location. Sometimes I get called before the production designer. Now the production designer is the person who, who runs, you know, really is in charge of uh, everything, like the entire look of a show. So, you know, you watch The Sopranos and even, you know, the costumes are dictated also by the production design of the show. It all kind of has to match. They talk about a color palette, um, things like that. So, you know, when I start a show, producer calls me, introduces me to a production designer. We, you know, usually um, we decide we're going to be best friends for the next six months. And we, you know, start uh doing what we what it is we do so you know uh we'll both okay. look at, we'll both look at this scripts 
and read through the scripts and say, you know, we have different ideas. What do you think? What do you think? Um, and, you know, having, usually I'm working with somebody who's been working in, in and around New York before. And so they'll have specific targets like, oh, let's go to, you know, um, this location or that location for this, this would be a good match for that. Um, you know, I, I'll give you a, an example of like, I, I worked on a show a few years ago called Godfather Harlem um, with a guy named Dan Lee. And we were, it, it, it was historical fiction that we were doing. And, um, you know, it was based on uh, the life and times of Bumpy Johnson uh, as he got out of prison and, um, you know, predated American, American gangster um, from the, you know, 70s. This was like the 60s and it was a TV show and it's still on. Um, but we, you know, we had to find, you know, things like the social club that they hung out in. So how do we do that? So, you know, fortunately now there's Google you know, and there's the internet and we're able to just, you know, type away, uh, you know, Palma Boys Social Club. What did it look like? Where was it? You know, and the internet is such a, a wonderful resource um, of, of just information that, you know, we can um, pinpoint exactly where something was. And if we can't be at that exact location, we have to recreate it somehow. So, you know, I was, you know, going to things like the, um, uh, what is it called? The, um, the Freemasons Lodge in Brooklyn, the one in Manhattan as well. Um, Upper Manhattan has a, a very large lodge, but, um, you know, you find yourself going down different avenues like that. And there's just so many, there's, you know, just a, a, a endless amount of ideas that come at you. And sometimes when you're starting a show, you just get in the car with a production designer and you drive around for inspiration. And um, it, um, you know, it, it happens that organically. And then, you know, the next thing that happens is, you know, you, 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 you sort of um, do your thing with the production designer for several weeks and kind of um, have different ideas about different locations. And then you go to the creators and say, hey, why don't you take a look at these pictures? Tell us what you think. And they either say, uh, you know, this is right on or we need to go in a different direction. And you kind of keep going that way. It's like a big piece of marble and you keep chipping away at it until you've, you know, got something, you've got some sort of sculpture, you've got some kind of form of something. And then, you know, um, depending on the budget, depending on um, timing, stuff like that, the director will come on. Once the director comes on, then things get, you know, a little more streamlined. They have their ideas, uh, they, they wanna fine tune things, and, um, you know, and then it starts to feel real. Um, but, um, you know, and then from there, it, it just, you, you know, it's almost like in TV, we talk about beat the clock, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost like how, how quickly can you do this? Because, you know, there, there were cases where I've had, you know, um, two months to prep for a pilot of a show. And I've had cases where I've had two days to prep for an episode of comedy. Um, so I've done it all different ways. Um, it's always an adventure and I always learn so much along the way. And um, there's just so many great people in the business. So um, I, I guess maybe that gives you an idea of what I do, but um, you know, once 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 we're shooting, um, then I'm kind of the um, my department works as the go between uh, with the city and permitting, and um, we we you know we we're we're I I call us the um, you know human interactive. Uh, department because we're 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 not 
dealing with actors, we're dealing with the general public. And so we have to be the face of a production that um, might not always seem, seem human. <laughs> and, and so um, it's, um, it helps to have people skills when you're in the locations department because you're dealing with the general public. And um, um, what can I say? Um, no, it's true. And I mean, I know you have an encyclopedic knowledge of the city. Yeah. So that, and also you're playing it fast and loose because talk about what happens if a location falls through and you're about to shoot there. Which happens all the time. I mean, it's just a part of, it's a part of the story. You know, you, you almost have, you know, uh, on a, on a very uh, regular basis, you have a producer coming to you, you know, knocking on your door saying, Hey, is everything all right? Is everything okay? Is there anything I need to know? Basically what that producer is saying is, uh, do we need to be looking for another location? You know, um, because that, that is so common. Um, and it, and it, and it's, um, you know, just a lot of times it's just circumstances. It's just circumstances beyond our control. So, um, what do we do when we lose a location? I mean, you know, you usually have a plan B, uh, you know, and, and, and I always, always when I'm, when I'm scouting with a director who really likes to pick things quickly, I'll say, all right, this is awesome. I love that you love this, but can we please just look at a backup? Because I, you know, I'm very confident that I'm going to be able to pull this off for you, but we just need, we need to have a plan B. So we, we always, we always have a backup. Um, we're also not just talking about exteriors. You're talking about interiors as well. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah. And, um, you know, anything, any number of things can happen. It can be weather related. It can be, you know, there could be a snowstorm and, you know, you're not going to, and you're trying to shoot uh, without snow. And then the, what, what inevitably happens is um, whenever you need snow, you never get it. Um, so it's, that's, that's where movie magic comes in a lot. Um, there's uh, any, you know, I can give you a million different reasons why a location is not going to work out at the last minute and it's almost never due to you know anything that the production has done it's just you know for for one reason or another it's just not going to work out so um that's why you always have to be able to roll with it yeah once can we talk about what happens with a period piece such as godfather of harlem Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's Super really complicated. Everything has to yeah. change. Yeah. So I, I've done period a, a few times. Um, I did it. Um, I did it uh, on a show a long time ago. It was called Life on Mars, and that was a British show that we brought to New York, and it was for ABC, and it was a great concept. Um, and it was supposed to be 70s New York. And this, this guy, uh, you know, basically, we don't, we don't know whether it was science fiction or whether it was somebody's dream, but, um, you know, uh, I had to do 70s New York for that. Uh, Godfather Harlem, I had to do uh, early 60s New York. Um, you know, one of my colleagues worked on a show called The Americans, which um, they did 80s, uh, you know, New York and DC. And, you know, for what it's worth, it's, it's almost harder in, in many ways, you, you would think it would be easier, but it was actually in some ways harder to do 80s than 70s or 60s, because the transitions are, are different. Cars are harder to get, you know, uh, classic cars from the 60s are more sought after. So there's more of them on the road. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that, that was a props problem. But what, what Lorna is alluding to is the fact that when we shot on the street, which, you know, for both of those shows, we shot on the street quite often. Um, you, you basically, everywhere the camera sees, it has to be, you know, 1963. So, you know, you can't have modern air conditioners. You can't have modern awnings on the, on the buildings. Um, you can't, um, any, any, you know, you name it, you don't, and you don't start thinking about this until you're working on a show like this. And then your eyes 
train themselves to, you know, every single block you look down, oh, th that's probably a good block for period because there's not too much, you know, modern stuff on it. There's not, you know, there's not all the, all, you know, the retail, the retail is what, you know, really kind of kills you when you're, when you're trying to do period because it just, it's an ever changing, ever so modern thing. Um, and, and, and it's very rare to find a street that just looks perfect for period. I mean, you really, the production designer and the art department, they really have to have their way with it. So, um, you know, that's where location managing for shows like that, um, you have to have this vision where you can look at a street and say, all right, this has potential. Uh, and, and then, you know, you get together with the production designer and the art director and, and, and then they say, all right, um, can, you know, we need to make deals with basically every single person on the street to, you know, um, modify their building in, in one way or another, or, you know, um, you know, you, a lot of times you do it with background actors, you know, um, you, you, you put background actors in costume and all of a sudden it looks like 1964. Um, so, you know, locations are the canvas. And then everybody else throws, you know, throws their stuff into the uh, into the mix to to actually make the finished product. But but the starting point is, you know, especially when you're shooting outside, is the location itself. Are there certain parts of the city that are more of a go to go to sites for you, depending upon the project? Yeah, I mean, you you know, we would definitely like, uh, you know, for instance, I worked on a, a Tina Fey project uh, for eight years called Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, and um, our, you know, we we were in a we were in a fictional neighborhood in New York, but it was it wanted to be, uh, you know, how do I how do I politically correctly use the term rundown? So it was. Uh, they 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 called it um, they 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 were it, it was there was it was like a um, they never identified it as as anything that was actual in New York um, but they they referred to it as the sludge front because um, at at one point or another um, the whole neighborhood was overtaken with some form of sludge uh, and it was just you know a part of the lore of the neighborhood. And um, one of uh, Carol Kane's character, um, she loved everything about it because it was ungentrified and it was untouched and it was just this, uh, you know, old New York gem. So um, we shot near our stage. Uh, we were at Broadway stages in Greenpoint and we kind of made, you know, we made light of the fact that the neighborhood at the time was changing. This was when all of the uh, high-rise buildings were being built over there, and now it's finished. I mean, it's almost an unrecognizable neighborhood since I we started that job, and I think we we started Kimmy Schmidt in 2015, and it, we probably wouldn't be able to shoot it now in that neighborhood. We'd have to go somewhere else because um, it's 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 unrecognizable. It looks like Vancouver now. You told us a very interesting little anecdote sure. about some bungalows that were filmed for Boardwalk Empire. And this this is a very interesting thing to think about in terms of how certain neighborhoods are memorialized in film right. and TV. So, you know, one, one, one thing that is, you know, just treasured in location departments in general is scouting itself. And, uh, you know, good scouting produces uh hidden gems like that so i'll i'll explain i had a scout uh by the, his name is wellington lee uh and you know he had a photographer's eye and we had him looking for something completely different it wasn't even uh we weren't looking for beach bungalows this was for um uh, this was for the the life on mars show that i did uh and you know, he came across this. And sometimes that's what'll happen when you're out scouting, you come across this really unique thing and you just, you have to stop what you're doing and, and photograph it because it's like, 
all right, somebody needs to figure this out. This is too cool. Maybe the, you know, if we tell the writers about this, they could write to it. So that wound up not happening on Life on Mars, but what wound up happening is, um, you know, those, those photographs um, went on to be used uh, for scouting for Boardwalk Empire. And, and one of my other colleagues, Amanda Foley, who worked for me at, at um, Life on Mars, she, she went on to be one of the managers at Boardwalk Empire. And uh, she remembered it. She remembered Wellington scouting it. She remembered seeing it herself. And um, that wound up being a featured um, uh, location for, I, I, you know, I think more than a season. They, they played it as old time Atlantic City. And that location is actually, it no longer exists, but it was, I think it was pre-Sandy. And it was, um, it, was on, it was on the bottom part um, of Staten Island on the Atlantic, uh, on the Atlantic side, and they were old, truly old beach uh, shanties. You know, like families would go would use them for the weekend, and they were probably built around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and you know, and I'm I, I'm grateful that they were used and photographed, and it's a terrible shame that they're gone. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of those that's one of those things that you you know you come across something like that and you have to you just have to go for it. What's the greatest challenge you've ever faced finding a location, or convincing a director and designer that that should be the location? <laughs> I well, I, a couple of years ago I worked. I, I'll give you another anecdote. I worked, and this this is when I truly came to realize that really anything is possible in in Hollywood. But um, I was working on a show called Lisey's Story. It was a Stephen King uh, novel that was turned into a limited series for Apple TV, and the director director Pablo Lorraine and Guy Diaz. Uh, was a production designer. And this guy, I, I never met anybody as just, you know, creatively energetic and just such a, a positive motivator the way this guy was. I mean, it, it was almost like, you know, I don't want to sound, I don't want to make it a bigger deal than it was, but it was kind of like working with him was what I would imagine playing basketball with Michael Jordan is like, he made me better. He made me better at my job because he made me think about things, you, you, you know, like literally anything is possible. So let me tell you the story. So we are looking for a farm. The farm is supposed to be, I, you know, maybe it's in New England, maybe it's in Maine. I don't remember the story, to be honest with you. Um, but um, I had to look for, you know, the closest, most authentic looking farm uh to the five boroughs and we had you know we we were going to shoot there for a long period of time so um couldn't really go outside the zone let me explain the zone to you the zone is a uh, 30 mile radius of columbus circle and once you go outside that zone it costs a lot more money to make a television show because you you have to pay a premium to all the crews and you have to pay travel time and stuff like that. So producers and 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 um, you know production companies don't they 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 they're doing it more now because there's more money. But um, traditionally, it, it it was it it was very rare to go outside the zone. And if you went outside the zone, you would do it for a day. So anyway, this was a uh, location that we were going to need to shoot at for like you know four or five weeks. It was very prominent and. Uh, there was lots of exterior, so it wasn't something that we could just build as an interior. We, we in fact, did build part of it as an interior. Um, but we, you know, we had to feature the exteriors and we had to feature all the elements of the of the uh, farm itself. And, and um, you know, so we've, we've, we, we found this place in Rockland County, um, not too far from the city. And the director just fell in love with it right away. Um, and we, we had scouted for a few others, but he was like, this is the one. And I was like, great, you know, the, my, you know, my job is finished here. 
And what I quickly realized is my job was not finished because as soon as <laughs> he said, Matt, I want this place, but it needs to have a pool. And not only does it need to have a pool, it needs to have a pool right here, which is like between the house and the barn. Like, in other words, we couldn't just put a pool where somebody would naturally put a pool on a, on a large piece of property like that. It like, we literally had to disrupt the, the, uh, you know, everything on this property. We had to, the, the pool had to be here and it had, you know, and it was, and it kind of became one of those things. Can you get it for us? Can you, can, can you see if these people would be interested in, in having a pool put into their house and, you know, we'll, we'll leave it there for them. You know, we'll, we'll, and this is a real swimming pool. Um, this isn't just like movie magic swimming pool. This is like, we're going to get a pool company. They're going to come here. We're going to get this done. And it was all like, I only had before we started, I, 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 from the time that that conversation happened, I think I only had about five weeks, five or six weeks before um, that pool had to be like filled with water and Julianne Moore had to be swimming in it. So, I, you know, the first time the director talks to me about it, this is the first time anybody's asked me a question like this in my career. And I'm like, okay, um, let me get back to you. Happy to ask the question. Um, so it, 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 wound up, you know, I went to the owner, I said, all right, this is, yeah, I'm going to sound like a crazy person, but this is what, this is what's being asked of me. And we're going to ask you the same question. And would you be interested in doing that? And, you know, we, we, not only that, we want to, you know, we want to be in your, on your farm for, you know, five or six weeks on top of putting a pool in your house and would you would you be okay with that? And um, she was, you know, up for an adventure. Um, and and she uh, she just said, um, if I don't like it, will you take it away? And we said, yeah, we will. And so that was kind of the condition of it. And and she was like, and if you take it away, it needs to look exactly the way it looks right now. I said, well, let me, let me, let me see if I can make that happen. Let me see if that's a possibility. And um, Guy, the production designer, Garrett, he promised me that 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 would happen. And um, that did happen. We did it. We did it. We talked this, we, 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 we talked her through it. We dug a pool. We put a pool in. It was a beautiful pool. It was like over a hundred thousand dollars for the pool. I mean, it was like a, a, like a pool like you've never seen before. If you watch this show, um, in fact, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, sharing my screen. Let me see here. Um, um, story. So this is the farm as is. And let me get I'll show you where. Can everybody see my screen? No. No? Isn't is nobody see, seeing my screen? No. Okay. No. Huh. You have to click on share screen. Okay. At the bottom. And select the screen that you want to share. Yep. Okay. So as you can see, this is a beautiful farmhouse. It was built sometime in the late 17, early 1800s. And this is the house. This is the barn. And we put a pool right here. 
And if you were to go there today, this is exactly what it looks like today. It's like we were never there. And that's that's what I'm I'm always so impressed with 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 what we can do. Um, it, anything anything truly is possible. Um, but um, I got sidetracked. Lorna, you were asking me about. Um, no, that's yeah. I just that's a very good example of a really yeah. good challenge that you met, and luckily it had a happy ending. Right. Is there, do you have a favorite find? Something obscure in New York City that was an aha moment for everybody involved. Um. Well, uh, so let, getting back to um, Kimmy Schmidt, so we 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 were looking for um, Titus's home, Titus's apartment, um, for for months. You know, my uh, producer had me looking all over Brooklyn for you know just a, a brownstone that looked like it could be something that you know, an apartment that that our main character Titus could live in. And, uh, you know, I kept I kept saying we were, you know, we were at Green, we were in Greenpoint, we were at Broadway stages and and there was a uh, building right behind the stage. And I mentioned it, you know, the first week I was there and my producer was like, yeah, we could we, that's not what they want. They want to, you know, they want something in Brownstone, Brooklyn. And um you know, a couple of weeks went by, we scouted and scouted and scouted and, you know, nothing was coming up and everything was like 40, you know, 30, 40 minutes away from where we, um, where we, uh, where we were. Um, and, you know, like fast forward, like four or five weeks, then I go back to my producer and I said, Hey, I, I just, you know, I feel like we're doing ourselves a disservice here. Um, and this is right outside our door. This is like literally this house was literally across the street from our stage. And it was one of those things that, it, you know, at the beginning, he didn't even want to show that to Tina or Robert Carlock. Um, but then we got to that point and everybody was like, okay, let's try this. Let's do it. And, you know, it really became a character of the show. This was such an iconic, um, such an iconic backdrop. And uh, we actually made friends with all the neighbors on that street um, and the business next door. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, every, everybody was happy to have us back. And that, that's always my goal. And if you Google um, the Titus Burgess house, this location actually comes up on Google Maps, which is kind of amusing because <laughs> there's nothing spec there. I mean, there's just nothing there. I mean, it's like, but it's, it's now on tours. Like it's, you know, uh, you know, similar to like the sex in the city locations. So I would say that was definitely an aha. That was, that was like, um, something that we never would have considered and wound up being like just a, a brilliant, um, thing a, a brilliant thing that we all agreed was the right thing to do mm -hmm. it's interesting and i appreciate you sharing a story about an area that's not on the upper west side and not in greenwich village because yeah. obviously there are areas talk about what a hot zone is sure and the effort to try to spread production to other parts of the city right um so i'm going to stop sharing my screen um, um, so they, you know, when, when I was starting out on Law and Order, uh, for years, you know, Law and Order was the only, was kind of the only show in town. And then, and then there were like two or three productions total. One was New York Undercover. And then there was SVU came a few years later. And it was really, there was very limited number of jobs. And, you know, I hate, I'll, I'll just say it. I mean, we kind of had carte blanche. I mean, we, you know, with the mayor's office, we, we, you know, my boss at the time, Mo, uh, you know, had a very good uh, rapport with um, 
the city and uh, you know they were uh, working so well uh, and there wasn't it it wasn't so disruptive you know there wasn't so many productions there wasn't it wasn't you know all encompassing and um, you were able to go to the Upper West Side and shoot in a building over and over again and you know our our trucks weren't taking up five, six blocks of the city, we were taking up, you know, a half a block or a block. Um, and, you know, it seems so much more reasonable now looking back on it. But um, what what came to pass is the more the more productions uh, came, um, the the you know, the infrastructure of the city had to sort of gird itself against, uh, you know, just um, neighborhoods being inundated by filming and that's really what happened like to the upper west side um you know among others the you know there's uh brooklyn heights and um just places that just got filmed over and over and over again and the neighbors have enough you know i i i i am very sympathetic to um people you know coming home and not having a place to park um i totally get it um so what the mayor's office did uh, all all those years ago, I think it was, it started during the Bloomberg administration. They they uh, created these hot zones. So if a neighborhood, you know, and I don't think they ever called them hot zones. We called them hot zones. They were they were neighborhoods that were quote unquote on hiatus from filming, and they were put on hiatus because enough uh, of the neighbors had started calling the mayor's office of film to say enough is enough we we can't handle this anymore um so they would put them they would put these blocks or these whole neighborhoods uh these whole zones on a on a on a list and you weren't able to um film there for periods of time you know i the one example that i can give you from law and order we spent i mean over and over and over again, not only the Upper West Side, but we would go to Inwood uh, because the apartments were so large, you know, and, the, and they were so film friendly to shoot in. The hallways were nice and wide. And that was, you know, that was our show, Law and Order. That was Briscoe and Curtis walking down the hallways and going, you know, and interviewing people in apartments. That was, that was, that was classic Law and Order. Um, but, uh, yeah, Inwood became, you know, they organized and and that for a long time became a hot zone. So I don't know what the status of that neighborhood in particular is currently, um, but for many, you know, for many years, it was a great place to film and then you couldn't film there at all. Um, I would say the current state of affairs is, is you know, it's better and more film friendly. The, the mayor's office has gotten more savvy about pinpointing um you know very specific areas so the hot zones have shrunk uh and you know they they are willing to work with you in terms of uh all right well you know maybe you can film on that block but you can't take any parking or you can only take parking on one side of the street uh you know and as soon as you're finished shooting there you have to give up the parking it's really all about parking and i you know um dean mccann who who uh, unfortunately, uh, God rest his soul. We, we we just lost him a few months ago. He was the deputy commissioner for a while. Um, he was the first person that said to me at one point, because I I had asked him, "Can we film there? Can we film?" It? He's like, he finally said to me, "He goes, Matt, you can film anywhere. I'm just not going to be able to give you a permit, and you're not going to be able to park. <laughs> so good luck." Um, and and that kind of opened my eyes to to really what what it's all about. Um, but that's what the hot zones are, and they still exist. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're I think they're uh, a necessary part of um, making it making this city manageable for everybody. Because like I said, when I started, when I was a, a little bitty intern many many years ago, uh, there was only two or three productions in New York City, and now currently uh on you know you know forget about the strike but if if things are are working the way they're working uh you're talking about anywhere between 65 and 80 productions uh going at any single period of time 
during the course of a, a production year. Uh, and that's been going on year upon year upon year um, for since probably 2012, 2013. It's, it's increased exponentially and it's been uh, a boon to the local economy and it's created many, many jobs. Um, you know, it employs, it, it, the film industry uh, currently employs about a half a million people uh, conservatively in, in New York City now. Um, so we, we, we are great, you know, I'm grateful to have it. And also it's the trickle down effect because it's not just people working in the industry, it's the caterers. It's Absolutely, the yeah fabric for the costumes department right and, the and, economic I, impact and, and, and 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 i can't tell you how many times you know we're shooting on you know like last summer i, I was working oh here's another anecdote of uh period uh except it was a really different kind of period i worked on a show called the peripheral which just aired on uh amazon um we we had a code name for the show uh it was very covert and i was doing a dystopian london in the year, uh, I think 2125. So I had to, we had to, we had to figure out how to do that. So one of, you know, we, we spent a day, you know, we shot in a lot of parks and we shot, uh, you know, uh, at, uh, at a place called Agarfish, which is located in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, great location. Uh, Mark Agar is a, a hell of a guy, and really, I, I I actually almost wish he was on this um, call because it, you know he's got a working knowledge of New York too, and he's got this great facility um, that can be used, and it and it really works well for almost any. It's timeless. Let's put it that way. But um, one of the locations that we had for the peripheral was Elizabeth Street, and you know, I, I, this production had a huge budget. So we bought almost all the businesses. And when I say bought, you know, we, we gave them, um, we, we went to them and said, Hey, we're going to affect your business on this day of shooting. And, you know, what do you, what do you, we're going to be there all day. So, you know, tell us, tell us what you make in a day. And within reason, we, we can, um, probably uh compensate you for your um for the inconvenience of having us film there and that that's that's really the most ideal situation you can hope for with a film crew is that they can do that with a neighborhood so you know not only did we do that but like around the corner was on the next block was um the Christina Tosi's milk bar and we you know got ice cream for the entire neighborhood and bought out the milk bar for, you know, three or four hours on a very hot summer day. And we're just telling the neighbors, Hey, just, you know, go to the milk bar where we're, we're um, you know, it's on us right now. And we did that same thing at bank of America building. We, we, there was a Starbucks right there and um, you know, we bought out the Starbucks for several hours and, you know, film crew with a big budget, that's what they can do. So um it's helpful. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, it goes a long way with the neighborhoods. Yeah. It's also, it's, it's, it's public relations is such a big part of the film industry. And I mean, just one anecdote that you'll remember from Law and Order, because yeah. we can get into set dressers and what they do in terms of transforming an interior for the shoot, but we would go into these small apartments, such as the one in Inwood, and the whole crew would be in there and yeah. we wanted that we would wind up getting thank you notes from the you know from the people whose lives we had turned That's around true. for days saying you left your, my apartment cleaner and nicer than when you came in thank you can you come again That's that that is absolutely true that that happened and you know what, what another thing I'll say is when I'm when I'm talking to first timers um and there's not as many of them as there used to be when when Lorna and I were doing this together years ago but most of these people had never done filming before. Now it's a whole, you know, it's, it's a business, you know, it's a side hustle for uh, a lot of people. They, they rent out their apartments to filming all the time. So they, they, they know the deal and it's helpful, um, but they're also very savvy. So, but, you know, anytime I'm talking to a first timer, one of, one of the first, you know, things I'm saying to them is, 
listen, I'm working on a TV show and chances are I'm going to want to come back here. And so I want to be your best friend for, you know, two weeks, three weeks, six months and, and, uh, you know, whatever it takes. So, um, it's my goal that when we finish this with you, I can tell, you know, I can see you're nervous. I can see you're, you're tense and you're worried about having people in your house. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, it's going to be like having the circus in your house for, you know, a couple of days. We're going to turn your life upside down. But at the end of it, it's going to be like we were never there. And you're going to have a, a nice little, you know, not insignificant check in your hands um you know maybe it's not gonna it's not a lottery winning but maybe it's gonna pay the mortgage for a month mm -hmm. and that's that goes a long 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 way it really does and i was always amazed at people who had very high-end apartments or townhouses who obviously didn't need the location fee right would often let us shoot just because for bragging rights or exactly. whatever exactly i was about to say that there's there's a whole subset of people that really you know, like to have a story at a cocktail party. <laughs> and, that, and that works in our favor as well. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody, I'd like to open the conversation up to see if other people have questions. Just uh, raise your hand using the function for reactions, I believe, on your screen. And we'll get to you. Or um, else we'll just keep talking for a few more minutes. <laughs> Susan, unmute yourself and we'll uh, hear what you have to say, Susan Hopper. Is that better? Yes. Yep. Oh, great. Well, I, that was very, very enjoyable. I just wanted to mention before I ask my question um, that I live across the street from Pete's Tavern. And so film crews in my neighborhood are regulars common and uh what is obvious to me is that the actors get driven up in a car after hours of of all the set people and the lighting people and everybody getting ready they walk into pete's tavern they're filmed through the window they get back come out get back in the car and leave and the crew is still there so it's the crew working for many hours for like a, a 15 minute experience for the actors. And then they get driven, they get driven home. But um, I have two very different questions. One is there are a lot of historic streets in my area, but there are also all of these outdoor restaurants in the streets. That, that must be a problem. So that's question number one. And the second one is, is there any way we can help you find historic neighborhoods that are maybe less well known than Brooklyn Heights or Greenwich Village? So start with the first one in the street. Sure, sure. Thank you, Susan. And and you, you're making a very good point. And it's um, it is not easy for us since the um, outdoor dining started. Uh, first of all, when the when the pandemic was in full, you know, when when we were back to work, but the pandemic was going, the mayor's office of film wouldn't let us park a truck within 50 feet of one of those uh, exterior dining sheds. Um, and uh, and even to park on a street that one of those existed, we had to get the permission of every restaurant owner on the street and they had to say that it was going to be okay for us to put a truck there so uh, a, a difficult job became much more difficult uh, and in some cases impossible and we would have to go back to our uh, producers and say sorry we're not going to be able to shoot on that street there's you know there's restaurant sheds and we're not going to get a permit for it so uh, we have to come up with another plan and you know so what would happen is you'd park things farther away um, and it just makes for a longer production day. That's re that's really what that translates to is the the farther the trucks are parked away from our from our from the action, the longer it's going to take us to film. And um, that's why it is just it's so important. Um, remind me, I'm sorry, Susan. Your second question second was question um, is. Um, 
we work, we've been working with historic neighborhoods for 50 mm -hmm. years, and we work all over the Bronx, and we work in a number of neighborhoods all over Brooklyn that maybe, some of which are gorgeous, mm -hmm. some of which really are very special, and some of which are very historic but seedy. Um, so if if we could help you with that too. I, you know what I would say off the top of my head, I would say, you know, um, I, you know, I, I have really good scouts and they can find a needle in a haystack, but, um, you know, if you want to, if, if, if you're interested in featuring those places, um, I would get involved directly with the mayor's office of film. Um, and, you know, uh, they have, they have like, um, as part of their website, they, they have like, you know, featured locations and things like that stuff. That's like, you know, they want, they want to highlight things that are film friendly um, because it makes their job easier. If a production is going to go to a place that's film friendly, it's only going to make it easier um, on the um, mayor's office of film. So I would, I, I, I would, would, be I would nice. I, yeah, I would go to, I would go to them. Okay, I'm not saying that's something HDC would necessarily, you know, want to do, but I love the idea of money going into the pockets of some of the um, lower income communities who sure. tend to have many historic buildings. And I and 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 I will I will add to that. My favorite jobs are the are not the high end jobs. I would never want to be like the location manager for Sex in the City or, or you know, uh, Succession or. You know, that's not my, that's not my bag. I'd rather go and, uh, you know, give somebody a little bit of money and it really is sort of a life-changing thing for them. It's really awesome to be able to do that. I love that part of my job. Well, we can, we can talk about it. We can think about yeah. it, but um, we certainly know a lot of hidden secret neighborhoods. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Ika, you've got your hand up. Just thank you. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful presentation. Um, I just wanted to, I don't have a question. I was going to ask about the sheds, but that's been answered. My other comment was that you actually help more than you think in some of the neighborhoods. I am on a block association. I live in Chelsea. There's a lot of filming in Chelsea, um, West Chelsea, and you tend to donate to the block associations and that money goes to either planting trees or putting in new flowers in our flower beds so you're actually helping more than you know so thank, thank you. you thank you for thank you for bringing that up and and no. um, and thank you for giving me that compliment on behalf of all of my colleagues in the business all uh, of the block associations well, in Chelsea well, appreciate what, what, what I'll say to everybody is you know we're not you know, this is not something that we want to avoid. We we actually appreciate it when somebody comes forward and says, hey, this could really help us if you could do this. Yeah. And then it makes us feel like, all right. Yeah. And you know, we plant put, trees, you know, flowers. We'll, we'll put our money where our mouth is, you know. So thank you for, sure. all, thank for you. always doing that. Chelsea thank appreciates you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. John? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you very much for the presentation. And I think you've answered all of my questions in the chat, but um, how can we really help the outlying neighborhoods if they want to have filming activity? And you mentioned the economic benefits, is that more general or do they get direct? And you're, the last person mentioned that block associations and groups get funds, but how direct is that support? If someone, say, in Astoria or Douglastown or wherever wants something, and does it outweigh the hassle? And I, uh, not parking, I, I don't own a car, so I'm not the right person to ask about parking. But anyway, just curious. Yeah. Um, well, I think Lorna said it best. It really is. So it is a bit of a trickle down. You know, with the, the homeowner themselves get, you know, the lion's share of the uh, location feed directly. That's the direct impact. Um, but then the indirect impact is, you know, say we're shooting on a street in, you know, sure, Douglaston, for instance. Um, 
we're going to need to buy coffee for, you know, 250 people. Um, and not only one coffee, it's going to be like coffee throughout the day and snacks and drinks and, um, you know, you name it. So where are we going to go? We're going to go, hey, we're going to ask the homeowner, hey, where do you go for like, you know, bacon, egg and cheese sandwiches in the morning? Like, you know, where, where's a good place that I can um, get some, you know, easy, quick snacks, you know, stuff like that. Um, where, where's the nearest drugstore? We need to buy band-aids for, you know, we need to buy, we need to buy water. We need to buy, you know, I mean, you name it, a crew needs it. We need, we, we need, we need everything. I mean, it's like, it's like a traveling mash unit. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but it, it like it, we are a needy bunch of people <laughs> and that's, that's, it's a Hollywood cliche, but we are a needy bunch of people and um, wherever we go, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're glamping. Yeah. Thank you, John. Kristen, hello. Hi there. Uh, thank you for this presentation, first of all. Um, I'm, I sent a message to Matt um, directly, but so I live in Harlem on Strivers Row and we oh, do. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. We I'm do have. Also a Harlemite. <laughs> oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, good. And I would love to use my brownstone or we have the alleyway in back of our house that we have. And I sent you the name of Rod and I, who kind of, he helps with the alleyway and I would. Uh, so is that what we, we would do if we were interested in, in um, using our locations? And I, I love what you said about helping the community and giving to the committees, which I also agree really helps us to maintain some of these older buildings that are landmark, which is also great for the community. And it, you know, it's funny, I, I wrote all these notes for this and Strivers Row was on it. Um, I, I, you know, we, we scouted it several times for, um, Godfather Harlem. I don't know if we ever shot it on season one. We may have shot an exterior once or twice. Um, you know, here's what I'll say to to everybody. It's kind of like you you know you can you can find location websites to feature your location so that scouts and production companies will use it. But it typically works the other way around. It, you know, I'll I'll send my scouts out to mm -hmm. look for something very specific. And when they find it, they find it. And um, so it, I'm not gonna say it hurts, there's no harm in doing it. And in fact, um, those uh, websites are come in handy for commercials um, because commercials tend to not hire, you know, they might hire a scout or they might hire, you know, they might not have a budget to hire a location manager. and. They don't have to because it's not it doesn't fall under the same rules as as the DGA. Um, so uh, yeah, that that's what I would recommend is um, you know you could you could go to uh, any number of um, websites and and put your put your home on it. You know, um, okay, pretty easy to do. Are there any ones that you recommend in general or is... off the top of my head? I can't think of any. There's, 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 you know, um, there's a woman who used to do it out in Long Island. Her name was Debbie Regan. Um, she might be able to uh, direct you to somebody who works in the city, or maybe she would um, be interested in representing it. Okay. And that's not something that you do then you're saying like you wouldn't send scouts out to I, I well, I mean, it, like I was saying, like if I'm if I'm on a job that is, uh, hey, we need to scout Harlem, and can can we see about Strivers Row? You're going to be the first person I call. Okay. Um, but you know, it's not like it, it's it's is it putting the cart before the horse by you know, like if I were to finish this meeting and then pick up my camera and come over to your house and and photograph it nothing might happen for two years you know right. I may, you might not get a call from me and that's kind of the way it is when you put it on one of those location websites you know mm -hmm. it, it there's no harm in doing it but I wouldn't I wouldn't it's not going to like have a direct hit right you know? yeah I see what you're yeah. saying yeah thank you sure thank you Lisa did you have a question or were you just applauding everything that Matt just said Hi, uh, both probably. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, this was wonderful. This was really great. I thank you for putting it Thanks. together. 
And also, um, I just wanted to know, how did you get started in this? It seems like you kind of gotten a lot of other things out of it, like maybe, you know, fulfilling different needs as far as being able to help people and go into different neighborhoods. But is this something that you were always interested in as, with like architecture or New York specifically? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, thank And thank you. Um, I, it, you know, it almost this, this career picked me and I'll give you the shortest version possible, but it, 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 in, in so many ways, the film business is a family business. And, um, to be clear, my, um, brother-in-law who is beloved to me, uh, who, just, who we so lost, yeah, we lost him a few years ago. His, his name was Jerry Hewitt. He was a stunt man. And he was just an incredible guy. You can look up his name. He, um, anyway, that's not what I, <laughs> it's not what I wanted to mention. But anyway, um, when I was a young guy, I was uh, selling real estate uh, in the town I grew up in, uh, outside of Philadelphia. And, um, you know, so I had sort of a, a skill set for people and making deals um, built in. And, um, you know, every, he, like I said, my brother-in-law was a stuntman and every question that I ever asked him about making a film, I didn't realize this is what I was doing, but I was asking him about the locations. And he pointed that out to me one day. He goes, you, you, you know, you don't want to know about the stunts? I said, no, I want to know, like, how did, where did you film this? Because it doesn't look like the town that you said it was, you know, I was always interested in the fake aspect of it. Um, and he said, one day he said, you need to be a location scout. And I said, okay, what, what, like, what does that mean? And how do I do that? And, um, you know, uh, fast forward, I got an opportunity to be, a, uh, an intern at law and order. Um, and, uh, I, I interviewed and got that job and that's where I met my friend Lorna and, um, and, the, and 27 years later, I still have the, you know, a little bit of money in my pocket, so I don't need to go home. Um, it, it seemed to have worked out. <laughs> We're so glad it did. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering. Thanks. Thanks. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to thank Diego and Matt. It was great seeing you. Great hearing your stories. And Me too. thank you. It means a lot because it's been mentioned Historic Districts Council really cares about all of the neighborhoods throughout the city and oftentimes to see them celebrated on the screen means a great deal to our sense of pride and our identity. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, New York is not Chicago or LA or Atlanta. We're, we're always going to be New York and that's what I'm proud of here. Thank you, Lorna. And thank you, Matt. Thank, and thank you. you everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks. everyone. Thanks a lot. Good night.